great. It was incredible. You didn't have to have a cable. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, it was, so but it was line of sight. Printer. Yeah, and you had to have mirrors if it, if it wasn't in the right place. That sounds very complicated. It was, and that's why it failed. And that's why Wi-Fi is the de facto standard, standard yes. Gotcha. And okay. we'd rather transmit over four channels of Wi-Fi, your signal, back, yeah. than try to get everything over one channel of 5G. All right, so real quick, for, for today's lesson on branding, I really want to focus on connecting points and connections. Connecting um, points and connections, okay. So when I say connecting points of connection, what does that mean to you? Connecting points are connecting a PC and a laptop together, and those are the two points on the either end. <laughs> so that's what connecting points mean to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you should need to de define that just a little bit. So uh, when I'm referring to it, I'm referring to it mainly in regards to the idea of common experiences that connect us to other human beings and okay. make us feel like okay. someone understands us. Okay. I think there are experiences we all deal with in life that we all come across that when you meet someone else who's had that same experience, there's an automatic sense of connection that mm -hmm. you feel because it's just, it's not well, it's, something yeah. everyone has experienced or everyone you currently know has experienced. Yeah. Well, it's something that you've experienced, and it was a strong enough experience that that you remember that, and that's it. Really means a lot to you, and it made an impact on your life somehow. Yes, I mean, I think, yes. I mean, I mean, one of the common ones we always talk to, you know, in, in the military community is like people outside of the military aren't going to understand some of the stuff that happened in the military, aren't going to understand some of the things you went through and some of the thinkings you have, and you know, and same thing with combat. You know, someone who's never been to combat isn't going to truly understand someone who's been through combat. Correct. Correct. I mean, we can fantasize about it. We can make up stories about it. But until you've actually experienced it, you don't really know. And your experience is going to be different, potentially, than the guy next to you. Absolutely. Because you each had different life experiences coming up to that point. Yeah. And so, real quick, what I want to talk about is kind of, I think, one of the biggest things for brandings that I've seen really work effectively in the clothing industry and a little bit in the jewelry industry, but especially the clothing industry where I've studied quite a bit of time. Is, is finding connection points with your community mm -hmm. based upon your own experiences. Okay. So I want to start off by first having you just real quick list what are some connecting experiences that you feel like you've had in your life that would connect to other people? Um, well, birth of kids. Okay, so okay. Uh, being a parent. Yeah, and then being a parent, you know, um, like I've, I've said to many parents, you know, you don't understand the, the uh, how it's rational, rational to kill your teenager until you've been a parent. You know, you have those feelings every now and then. Um, and most parents do. Some don't. I've, I've met a couple that just look at me with blank, you know, uh, kind of deer in the, caught in the headlights kind of looks. But um, most parents understand that concept that uh, there's there are just some days that it's just Okay, so it's, parenting. It's, a, it's, it's an option. So yeah. parenting, yeah. frustrations of so, teenagers. Frustrations of teenagers, okay. frustrations in life. Um, but you've got the more um, um, positive things, you know, that, that dream job that you got or that great vacation that you took. or that you had great, a great vacation. Or that great experience on a vacation. You've had a great vacation. I haven't had a great vacation. Okay, I've had great about, experiences on your, vacation. Your connection points. I've talked about I've had great experiences on vacation. Okay. So what yeah. was the great experience on vacation and, and, that you had? Because I'm not aware of any of those. The one I remember the best is when we had the boat and you kids were jumping out of the boat into Lake Lanier. That wasn't a vacation. <laughs> we all lived there still. I know, but it was still a vacation. It was like a us. day was, trip. Well, no, we were there for a couple nights. Okay, maybe two nights. It was a break <laughs> I guess from the house. A, a mini vacation. Yeah. But, okay, so a mini vacation. But okay. I, I remember that. You kids still remember that. At least I know Paul and, and Shell do. I would, I, would I would mark that as great family time together more than a vacation personally. Okay. okay. I, I just, I never considered that okay. a vacation. But Good enough. All right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know that that job that you got that you were you know looking forward to that that turned out or um, that win on the job that project Again, that you I did want you, and you I completed. I want you to focus on things that you've experienced. 
like very personalized. Very personalized. So like I have experienced right. those things. Okay. You know when I got the job with Joel, that was the that was the dream job. Um and then I had a lot of experiences at that job that were really great. And there, you also know the other side of wins. it, which was what? Uh failure, utter no not even being able to do anything right, etc. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you also know what it's like when a company gets bought out and staying with the company yes. and going through the changes that happen when you go from a small-time company to a, a corporation conglomerate yes. company. Yes, yes, and how you get lost in the, in the, in the works. Yes, I know all about that. Because I think that was pretty impactful for you on your journey. It, what was impactful for me, but what was more impactful is when I saw another company go through it, a company that was started by an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur took care of his people, and people – you know, went above and beyond their job. He would make a point to make sure they got some financial reward. I mean, it wasn't huge, but, you know, $50, $100, a couple hundred dollars, depending on what it was. And it was something, you know, of course, that made more money than that. Yeah. But he would reward his people regularly, or reward people that did work, good work for him and did, you know, good quality work. He would reward them. And then this other company bought him out, and all of a sudden, all those rewards went away. Um, we don't care how good a job you're doing. We just want you to do your job. Yeah. And uh, morale in the group, in the company, I, I saw it over a, a four-week period, went from people in, in, excited, you know, I'm here, I'm looking for, you know, what we do. And, and it was just a simple little printer refurbishing company, okay? Yeah. Um, and people coming in and really excited about their job to in four weeks later, people dreading their job yeah. and not wanting to be there and people dropping out like flies because the great environment that he had created by being an entrepreneur, by taking care of people and realizing, you know, this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand. They talk about, you know, business people are all about the money, about the bottom line, but entrepreneurs understand the value of individuals where corporations don't. Corporations only care about, well, how do, how do these numbers add up? And that's the, the biggest problem when you have a CFO, which is what we ended up with, is the company that bought us out um, was a British company. And in Britain, just so you know, the CFO runs the company, not the CEO, the CFO runs the company. And so they constantly cut. And I actually had a customer tell me, hey, look, they run companies in the ground all the time. Because they keep cutting and they keep cutting and they don't look for new customers. They don't look for the concept of service. They keep cutting back the expenses until there's nothing left to cut back. And that's typically what you fall into. And I've seen that happen. Okay. So, I mean, that's another connecting point is having seen, I think, and I would describe that as, again, the, like, the transition from small-time entrepreneur to conglomerations. Yeah, is how, is how yeah. I would refer yeah. to that as. Yeah, but you know, for me, it was seeing a forty million dollar organization being bought that was making selling forty million dollars worth of product, going down to eight million dollars in a two year, yeah, roughly a two year span of time. Yeah, it would have been about. Can you imagine years. cutting it down that much? It just just like like a rock. Yeah. And then we had the executives, which was really great, saying, we know how to run a big company. We know what we're doing. You don't understand, you people running your little companies, how to run a company. We know what we're doing. But see, so that's like another connection point that I think you need to be aware of is like you understand what it's like to feel like you aren't valued by your company. And you also know what it's like to feel like you have valuable input for a company that doesn't care about that input. Yes. Those are all like very impactful connecting points that if someone else were to talk about, like, I feel like my company doesn't value my input, you could relate to very yes. quickly. Yes. Um, yes. That's why this exercise is so important to me is that you really, I don't think a lot of people take the time to really understand how much we can connect to other people through common experiences, whether we realize it or not. No, I agree. Um, I agree. And I mean, that of itself, if you ran to an entrepreneur and you were talked about that, like feeling of like people didn't value your input, you're going to connect to that entrepreneur so much faster than if you're talking about other aspects that don't 
really have emotional connection to you. Right, right, right. I mean, I can understand those corporate people who say, you know, I just, I'm done with my corporate job and I want to go out and start something. And I know, I know what direction they want to go is they want to go perpendicular to, we don't care what you think and all. And I, and I've, you know, I've, I've heard stories about all kinds of different businesses that are yeah. run well, run poorly and run everything in between. Like the one I was telling you about, uh, where they, where when you join, they are we're a distribution company. Where when you join, you oh, have yeah, to go, Michigan. you have to go to college, and you have to get a job at the end of your college time. Um, that's what it takes to work in our out in you know shipping packages for us in our distribution company. Versus another ship distribution company where we don't care if you're doing it. All we care about is that you show up on time and yada 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 and put in your time. And two companies running the exact same software. Uh, one has no problems with it, has maybe one error a, every couple, two, three months. The other one has errors every week and can't make, seem to make the software work. No, I mean, and it, just, it definitely happens. I mean, I want to think about some other connecting points so that you have. So, like, think about, like, cultures you've experienced. Right. So what are some cultures you've experienced that would be connecting points that if someone else was like, hey, I I know what that culture is like, you'd be like instantly like want to yeah. talk to them yeah. because of that connection. Yeah. Well, you know, we I grew up in Michigan. Okay. So, you know, so I've got Midwest and Michigan culture, which is its own kind of little bubble. Well, of, I think you need to be specific. I think Metro Detroit, Michigan, because that is very different than Western Michigan. Versus northern Michigan, yes. Um, at least at least my experience of, you know, the, the, yeah. the two places is that eastern metro Detroit, Michigan is very, very different than western, you know, Grand Rapids and Muskegon, Michigan. Yes, yes. I mean, those are two very different cultures. Yes. Very different cultures. And, well, the thing is, in between, you've got Lansing. And in Lansing, <laughs> there's that's where all the farming is. And so you've got a whole different culture in that region of, yeah. of Michigan. And then you have northern Michigan, which is basically the only thing that was ever made money up there was wood until they found oil. Yeah. And now, you know, whatever oil they get out of there, that's that's been a great a funder for, for things. Now, I will say real quick for the Michigan part, Lapeer was relatively the same type of town when I went there in high school as to when you were there in high school. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Yes. Right, from my understanding, there wasn't that really time. much by, by renovation that... housing wise. It really wasn't a right. bunch of new housing districts or right. new businesses in that area right. from like right. when you were a kid. Yeah, well, looking, for the most part. Right. Well, looking back, what I realized is Lapeer got put on the map by Apache Trailer, a company okay. that yep. no longer exists, has been out of business for, Not that I don't long. know, 30 years or something. It been... Yeah, it's been that long. At least 30 years, maybe 40 now. Um, But. Uh, Apache Trailer put the town on it on 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 the map, brought all kinds of businesses to town, and then the owner sold it. Yep, typical. Ca sound 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 typical. Here, give me just a second. I only, there's too much of the stand in the the shop. I just want to real quick try to. Okay. All right, there you go. But he sold it. And then after that, it went down and then went out of business shortly thereafter. Yeah. After they paid, uh, I don't know, $20, 30000000 million or something like that. Some, what in the day was a huge amount of money. Uh, but uh, that made the town. And then ever since that happened, the town has been in this kind of decline. And then by the time I got to high school, it was where pretty much you found it. But it, I got to tell you, it was... It was a, a little couple. It was a couple notches better than what it was when uh, the you were there. The plants weren't shut down. They weren't going through that. They, they weren't <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, it it was. Well, what that happened? That was a whole different cycle. Right, well, of, right. Well, of what happened craziness. was understand what happened was is Apache shut down. That pretty much decimated the entire business community. Yeah. Okay. So there were still things that you had to have like insurance and whatnot, and there were people that had ideas and 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 ran with those, but <laughs> for the most part. There was not any reason for any business to open in, in the pier. Right. But then uh, General Motors moved its plants from Pontiac, high crime area, yep. 
to uh, from Pontiac. It wasn't Lapeer. No, no, it's from Detroit to Pontiac. All right, that okay. sounds more. That makes yeah, more to sense. Pontiac and Lake Orion. The big thing was Lake yeah. Orion, <clears throat> and Lake Orion is twenty minutes down the road. Here, just so you know, and so being twenty minutes down the road, all of a sudden, all those people who were working in the plants started trying to buy homes close to the plant. They found out that that was the high rent district. That's where all the rich people lived on the south side of town there, and so they moved further north. Yeah, and the pier happened to be. In the middle of their commute back and forth. Right. And that did a lot to kind of stabilize things. But it never brought in enough business to really allow the city to grow again and and be anything close to what it was when I was a child. Well, I mean, from my my understanding, right, and mine's a little different during my high school days. I'm curious your thoughts. My understanding is it actually is a little bit of a different story that I saw. What I saw is that they brought in a lot of good jobs and great paying jobs at the time, but that caused a lot of people to just be stagnant workers instead of doing their own thing. And so it brought a very stagnant lifestyle. Yes. Because when I went there in high school, I was, I mean, it was, you know, what, 2010, I think, when we moved there, 2009. And so, I mean, that re- that 08 recession was hitting them hard. Plants were going out. And I had friends, you know, whose parents had never gone to high school diploma even that were making six figures working in the plants that just now all suddenly went out of business with no idea of what the next job was going to be because there were no <laughs> there were no other <laughs> there were jobs. no other plant no, jobs in no. there. And everyone else wants a high school diploma or a GED. And they had literally been making six figures without any of that. And they were happy and they loved their job. They'd been there for, you know, 15, 20 years. Yep. And they're now also being told, like, oh, go find another job. And they're saying they're going, the skills I have, there's not a job. There's, there's not, not a, not job, a job, job for to those. match those skills. No, no. And I don't have the, the education to match those skills. And yeah. I haven't set up a lifestyle to be able to go to college and be able to take time off to go do that. So there is this, like, huge, like, just what am I going to do mindset. Exactly. And so I feel, and I know from like my high school teacher, like she talked a lot about how like, you know, back in the day, I mean, this would have been during your high school days, probably, you know, Ford came in and was offering, you know, $10, $12 an hour to come work in the factory with no high school diploma. And so she had students, you know, friends of hers who literally just left the high school to go work in the factory because they were making more money than their parents had ever made Mm -hmm. working in the factory. And it just created this, you know, reliance upon the organization. Yeah. And when Ford screwed things up, they ruined a whole society that had been relying upon them for the last, what, 30 years, 40 years? At long least. time. Long time. Long time. And it wasn't just Ford. I mean, it's Ford, GM, Chrysler was yeah. there too. Um, you know, Chrysler started its, its trek downward during all that. So that yeah. even made it, you know, just a little bit of everything. And that's what Ford's running into right now with their whole EV thing is they're trying to switch over to building EVs and they're realizing that the people that they've had in the plant don't have the skills and some of them aren't at a place where they're open to being retrained yeah for the skills that they need for these I could new high tech jobs I could see it and um I don't think the politicians appreciate the reality of what that really looks like for real people uh, they want to talk about how this is the future and this will this will expand and this going, but it's not going to expand fast enough. There's not going to be, and it's going to require a different set of skills. That well, I think the hard point. I think the harder point is more of just a lot of people can't afford slash don't have the time. You know, I mean, right. I think about it. You know, like my friends, like both their parents were working for the most part. Mm-hmm. I mean, even though they're making really great money, both the parents still were working, yeah. and it's like if both your parents are working. And you have a lifestyle where you require both people to be working, then there's not. <laughs> well, who's, gonna, who's got the time to there, go to there's school? There's no magical time to yeah. go to school. Yeah, there's no magical time to learn the the traits. And you, and if you've got a family and you want to spend time with your family plus the fifty hour work week you're probably putting in the factory, good luck. Yeah. Well, the factory is forty hours. That's the good news. Okay, the good news is the factory is forty. <clears throat> it's hours. supposed to be forty. If you're a supervisor, um, it's fifty. Yes. Which but, is where at least most yeah. of my friends, they're, okay. they're a lot of them. Okay. Their parents so were they were the, the parents. All right. So they ran into that. But they were the but supervisor for the most roles. part, 
most of them were 40 hours. Yep. And the problem is, is you work 40 hours, but then when do you go to school? Do you just stay up all day? Do you, you know, run without any sleep yep. and, you know, work all night and then turn around and school all day? And yep. then when do you do your homework? Yep. And well, and you can't just take off work to, to get those skills. And it's not like you're, you know, you're 20, 19, 20 when you're, you're young and your body's able to do it. Most of these people are in their 40s and 50s. I mean, exactly. they're, they're significantly older. Their bodies are significantly wired differently <laughs> well, than when you're 19, 20. Yeah, there's some of that. And, <laughs> and, and some of it is, is just, how can I put it? You've got other things going on, too, by that time. Well, you know? yeah, I family. Mean, family, you've got kids life, that are parents that are getting that older. you want to spend time with and so on. And yep. Um, it becomes really difficult to make yeah. that switch. Um, you would almost have to do something where you um, actually set things up to have like maybe a uh, three-day work week or something. Um, Even where then, you do I... like three twelves, and then you do school on your off days. Right, but even you went to Mott, right? Part time for yeah. a minute, right? Yeah. Like, how was that like? Because you, I mean, that was not. It was, if I remember correctly, you were taking like one or two courses, and that was it. It was fine until I had to get a day job. Okay, and I'm like I remember I was you just coasting on my laurels, and not showing up to class at all because I couldn't show up to class yep. because I was working during those times. But I had a high enough GPA. I was yep. a straight A student up to that point. But on the other hand, I was only taking a couple classes. Right. So if I but if I could work like Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And then school, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I could make that work. But I'm going to throw this out there, and then I want to get back on topic, okay? Because this is something I was actually thinking about uh, last night, because mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of bugging me. Why are you thinking? <laughs> it's in my nature, what can I say? <laughs> but I was thinking about it last night, actually, and I, I'm kind of curious your thoughts. I think the biggest issue right now killing the U.S. job market is a focus on a generalized degree versus allowing specialized skill set. What I mean by that is I think of you with like SAP soft, you know, the SAP implementation. That was a specialized certification you were allowed to get to get the job. Right. To me, I think more companies need to focus on finding certifications like that where someone can in their own time learn, figure it out, do what they need to do to be able to perform that task and then prove that they know how to perform that task and get that certification rather than necessarily needing a two or four year degree with all the other stuff because that just adds time onto their clock for them to be able to be, be able to get that job. Right. If I only yeah. need to take one or two courses for a year and I can, you know, one or two courses each semester for a year. Right. So, mm -hmm. so four courses in total mm -hmm. and I can have everything I need to get that next year job. That then to me becomes doable. When you tell me I have to do four years worth of degree or two years worth of degree and I'm only able to do one or two courses. That's like what, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry, like, that's half the reason, like, why, like, I, I don't even want to go to college at this point, because it's like, why would I wait four years on top of everything else to just then start going again? To get a generalized knowledge that doesn't really apply to any specific thing, correct, and that's, that's the, that's so the, so to me, that's, I, and that's why I was curious your thoughts, because yeah. my thought is more of how can we get college, community right. colleges at least, right, and, and companies to start working together on going, hey, if someone wants to be able to be, you know, work on the robotic side or work on the battery field. This is what they need to know to do this job, right? These are the yeah. core whatever. Yeah. If they take these courses and get these core skills and prove that they can do that, then we'll hire them. Right. And and if and, we had more of that kind of cooperation, I feel like then for the workforce, it would be much easier and more motivating to go get those those handful of credits, those handful of skill right. sets, and then get that job. Right. And you need. To, yeah. waste all this time you need years. fewer hours and everything and believe it or not there is a place that does that i've not heard of that new york state does that okay run across a couple people in new from new york state uh most things are a one-year skill set program okay something that's really technical is a two-year skill set program and it is a skill set program yeah so um you have to either test out of english or you know there's a level of communication sure of writing and, and all that there no, you absolutely. have to you know meet but as long as you meet that level right. for that particular task or skill yep. set they just teach you the skills that you need to perform that task yeah and they have and there's they're a little generalized but it's the kind of thing that you know this there's a pool of people who 
can be an electrician or be a certain level of electrician. And then right. you can go in and you can go back and get another set stuff. of skills and so on. And it's the kind of thing where you can do it as night school. So you can work all day. Yeah. Go for a hour or two at night. Yep. And in six in a year's time, yeah, you can have, have all your certification and be able to walk into a job and say, here, I'm certified for this job that you're advertising. So the state of New York is doing that. And that's why okay. you're hearing about uh, Tesla, for instance, put their uh, solar panel factory in New York. That's one of the reasons they did that. Um, C4V, battery manufacturer. Here, the only people who have a uh, safe uh, lithium iron phosphate battery, okay. which a lot of people have heard about. But they have it, except they replaced the lithium iron phosphate with actually a biological material yeah. that's in your body that's we're integrated with lithium and it does it operates the same way as a lithium iron phosphate battery as far as charging and charge discharge cycles except that it can charge and discharge at 5c right which is where normally a lithium iron phosphate is a 1c battery and it still doesn't catch on fire right and it has double the storage gotcha or not double the storage it goes from 160 watt hours per kilogram to 220 so yeah. 40% more energy storage, but that puts it in the same category as Tesla's 2170 batteries mm. and all the other stuff gotcha. they've got. And you don't have to do any of the fancy cooling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All kinds of advantages. Yeah. No, no I got you. Um, but they re re moved from Michigan, yeah. their plant, to New York for that reason. Because, hey, we need people that have these specific skills. Yeah. And they can... And the community college will produce people with those specific skills. Gotcha. So that they can bring them in to the plant and say, hey, this is the specific machine we're working on. Here's the exact thing of all the things you've learned that you need to do. Boom. Just go for it. Yeah, I just I just was curious your thoughts because to me, I think that's the hardest thing right now killing our workforce is that we, we just have too, many, too much of requirements and it's too long of a process for someone who's 40, 50 years old to want to spend the next four years starting over yeah. basically right. from scratch well i mean it's great when you're a teenager or 20 in your 20s oh, absolutely. and you're you it's can go easier. live at home you know and parents at least put a roof over your head you know what i mean even if you paid for your own food just having a roof over your head is yeah huge no absolutely at, at you know offsetting a lot of that but when you've got a kid you have your own family and and yeah. all this other stuff it just it's not yeah and then you're going to take on additional debt so you know if you take on the debt for all this like typically you have to with college or Everybody, it, all the college level, folks want a you level to. of the debt. Yeah. yeah, you know, you end up now. It's like, well, I got this new job, but I've got all this debt that I'm adding on to all the other debt that I have yeah. because I'm not working, and yeah. it just no, no. That's that's why I just it, it creates an unwinnable situation. Because to me, I I, I think that's definitely a, a, a factor that in the U.S. I think companies and, and entrepreneurs need to start thinking about and considering is is how do you get a qualified workforce. That A is cheap, comparatively speaking, right? And B can produce the results. Mm -hmm. And I think not a lot of entrepreneurs are thinking about that, but it's something that I'm seeing stop a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of organizations in general right now in the market. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of it goes back to the politicians, is that they want to keep pushing this thing of college rather than pushing specialized education, which... They were fighting it when I was in high school. Yeah, I mean, we had a tech center that we opened up for people who wanted to do trades. So well, if you I wanted to learn how to do CNC. To your point, I think that. you're a little outdated. They, there's a lot more focus on the trades right now from the politicians, actually, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of uh, money going towards that. It's the jobs that haven't transitioned more than the, the, the political side right now. But if the political side was really had it right, then they would also have to transition the requirements to get the job. You would think so, but the businesses operate on their own. Yeah, but I don't think the businesses care so much about the No, I'm saying they, they do. They care about the state requirements that they're requiring. No, no, no. I'm saying that the businesses care right now still. Okay. It, it, it legitimately, like I've, I, just because I'm a little bit more involved with the politics well, than you are right now, well, and a little I'll, bit more involved with some of the organizational stuff, there's a lot yeah. more effort from the, the government on the trades right now. I think that's been a huge focus. Well, all I know is the electricians I've talked to 
say that the people, they can't hire people because they don't even have baseline qualification as far as the state requirement to be able to do the work. Not in Oregon. In yeah, Oregon, that's in not Oregon. an issue. No, I've, I've, I've got so many friends that are electricians. That's not the issue. The main issue in Oregon is the drug issues. That's the bigger issue than any of them. Find people who aren't who using? Who are clean, yeah, who are able to stay clean. That, that's been a bigger issue than any of the other stuff from everyone I know. Okay. Like, that, that's, like, the number one discriminator right now for them is that, you know, you smoke weed and you end up popping positive and you get canned. And then that, it was also, now it's been changed from my understanding. I was talking to a lady from EC Electric the other day, but, uh, and she was talking to me about how it used to be that federally speaking, if you pop positive, you automatically were not allowed to try again. Like you, you got banned. You were barred from ever being an electrician or trying to be an electrician again. That has since changed, or I don't know if it's changed or if they're getting ready to change it, but it's in the process of getting modified. Okay, but there was a time period when the government basically said if you pop positive for weed, like you were, you're done. You can't try again, and they're now trying to appeal that. Same thing with like truck drivers was the same way, because mm-hmm. it was like, hey, you pop positive for weed, you can't be a CDL light driver ever again. Which, it, I understand why it was like that to a degree, and I don't understand why it's like that. I mean, that's a whole different topic. I want to real quick get back onto our original topic, which okay. is on the connection points. So connections, yes. So you've got Michigan that's a connection point, specifically like the Detroit area, right? Michigan. What else are connecting point experiences that you've had? Well, then living in the South, in Atlanta. Okay. Which so I, Southeast. I, yeah, yep. South, Southeast, Southeast. Which I, I, I thought was really good because it, it taught Atlanta, me a lot, of, it's a, its lot of, a lot of a lot of its own world. Yeah. It's a special place. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, as I said, it's, it's a northern city in the South. Um, because most everybody's there is from nor- the north. It's a uh, decent way to and, put it. And there's a few southerners thrown in just to keep <laughs> let you know that you're still in the south. But I mean, there's a handful of them sprinkled in. A lot of people think they're southerners, but they're not southerners. No, I agree. It's it's a very northern. Their parents re- look when your parents are both from the north. Okay. <laughs> And you just happen to be born in the South. It's a very different experience than being this in the South <laughs> and brought up in the South and having parents that were brought up in the South or even half of your parents brought up in the South. Very different experience. This, this is very true for personal experiences. This is very yeah. true. People don't appreciate that, don't understand that, but it's the truth. It, it's a very different thing. Okay. So, yep. Okay. So, what are some other experiences? I know you were in Michigan during you were in the Metro Detroit area during the riot stuff of the seventies, right? Yeah, but do you I, remember that, or was that kind of before a, you cared? It was on TV. It was big news on TV. Um, I lived not in the suburbs. Lapeer's out like out in the middle of nowhere. So, it, so Flint wasn't what it is today back then. Uh, it was, but again, it's another world. Okay. I mean, you, you travel in those days, going 30 miles to someplace was a long ways. I That's had fair. relatives in Detroit. You don't understand. The relatives that we have in Detroit from my mother's side, mo- going from Detroit to Lapeer, which is a 50, 60 mile drive one way. Oh, okay? it's not that far. Yeah. Uh, no, no, these were downtown, downtown. These were guys like on eight mile. Road well, I mean, you've driven eight miles. It's not sixty miles to Lapeer. It's, it's it's fifty, sixty miles. Maybe both ways, not but, one no, way. No, one way. No, it's, no, it, <sighs> it can't it, be that yeah, far. It's, it's 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 that far. Anyway, but anyhow, for them, they're part taking extra food. They're packing water. They're packing <laughs> oil. They're packing things for their car to break down, and and everything is if they are traveling across the country, because. That was just out into the boondocks. Into 60 the, miles out, was that far. Yeah, it was that far in their minds, in their minds. You know, for us, it was no big deal. I mean, yeah. we just drive, drive down. And, yeah. And so we drove down more than they drove up. But uh, but that was just the nature. Okay. That was the nature That's of the crazy. thing. Yeah. Because you got to understand, when my, my father used to drive cars till they died, okay? Yeah. And so he would drive a car to 90,000 miles, and then it was literally falling apart. Engine yeah. was shot. The electrical system was shot. Um, the transmission was very questionable. Yeah. At 90,000 miles. Gotcha. So, you know, it's not like today where you're expecting 150,000 miles and, and you know, some of the, 
the yeah. uh, Japanese cars, you're expecting two hundred thousand. I mean, just two fifty, base, just baseline. You know, normal, you're going to yeah. get two hundred, and we're hoping for three hundred. Yeah, you know, kind of thing. So, um, very, very, very different That's world. That's crazy. And so things were were different. But it's uh, fair, I guess. But yeah. okay. But, so, but, but, but the but riots that... weren't like a big thing for you. No. Okay. No. no. Cuz I know other people from a little bit older than you that was like a huge experience for them. Right, because they oh. were down in Detroit. I was not in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean even people that just lived near Lapeer yeah. um that weren't in Detroit specifically but like had gone to Detroit yeah. and it, and had right. seen firsthand right. those but, riots. But, I wasn't sure if your family right. had experienced that because no. I know you talked about going to Detroit to like the big shopping malls from time to time. Right, right. But that was always in the northern outskirts. Gotcha. Not downtown Detroit. You never go in downtown else. Detroit. That's always dangerous. <laughs> always dangerous as long as I was okay. old enough to know the difference between <laughs> dangerous and not dangerous. Okay. All right. So we've got Michigan culture. We've got Georgia culture. We've got, you know, Oregon culture now that you've been a part of in the yep. Pacific Northwest. Um, Haven't done the Northeast yet. No. No, you've not. The one the one mm. thing in the yeah, Southwest. Coast. Haven't done the Southwest either. Yeah, but Southwest is, is pretty much the same as the North, Northwest. Uh, Arizona and New more, Mexico is pretty different more, from my understanding. Well, because it's all desert. But, <laughs> but anyway, but okay. Um, so you've got those living conditions. You've uh, got parenting as like life experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got your love of science mm-hmm. that's like kind of always followed your life. Yes, yes. Um, love of Star Trek. Yep. Yeah. I mean, sci fi, absolutely. Yeah. I think love of sci fi and love of, I would say, sci. How would you describe your love of science? I'm curious your, how you would define that or describe that to someone. Because I have a few things I'm thinking of where you and I actually really connected heavily on mm-hmm. as a kid. Um, not so much now that I'm an adult, but as a kid, we connected very heavily on science. Yeah. I'm curious how you would just describe your love of science. Well, understand I lived in a very different age. Yeah. Okay. So I lived in the 60s. So those of you who are not familiar with what happened is in the 50s, there were all these fantasies and all these dreams of going to the moon of computers and all that kind of stuff all right um in the 60s we did all that (laughs) we actually did it well it's 70s late 60s early 70s and and so in the 60s there was this move to this worship of science that you you missed out on yeah that you didn't see that you don't understand you can't comprehend (laughs) But you move to this this god of science, and um, that had a huge impact on people's perception of things, on uh, society, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of my love of science came out of that. Some of it came out of just the fact of, of there's people who are computer people and there's non-computer people. <laughs> And I was in the group of computer people. And so we always were kind of misunderstood and, and so on. So science was our, our, our place to go and, yeah. and be able to meet other people like us. Well, I'm thinking more of in the sense of like, I mean, even to this day, I, your love of experimentation with science in a sense. Right. Right. Your, your, your love of just trying and experimenting just quote unquote new revolutions in a sense. Correct. Right. Like I remember back in the day you had a I forget what it was, but some kind of battery that you were trying to build with like you were like, oh it's supposed to be like quote unquote this like really incredible battery mixture compound order. I don't remember it that well. But like it's a zero zero point energy battery that generates uh power without any consumption of any materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember you like literally went and like you bought the materials and you made the different batteries and you tested the different mixtures and you like played around with it to and like then I found prove out that it, it didn't and work. And then I found out it was a chemical reaction. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a chemical reaction. And so guess what? Yes, it's a chemical reaction. And yes, if you get enough material on each side of the battery, it that chemical reaction will run for a really long time. But it is not free energy. It it's is not still, free energy from nothing. 
Yeah. It is still a chemical reaction going on. But it's but that kind of I think love of science is more what I was curious right, about right. because I think but that's that, something that was that, but that, that for that, me was very impactful in my childhood. I mean, and, and we connected over right, a lot of. Right. I mean, there, there's okay, other right. ones that you had as well. I can't right, think of but, all but, of them, but, but there's like all these scientific things where you were very much like ready to do like the small scale version of test it out, try it, figure out does it work, does it yeah. not work, and and play around with it in that regard. Right. Which not every everyone's like no nor most are most parents are. like no 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 but understand what that is is that's a mixture of my parents and the world war ii and um the whole rationing thing and rationing stamps okay, okay? so part of it is we didn't have anything so you needed something to do something and you would figure out have to figure out how you can take what you can buy and make what you cannot buy <laughs> okay Okay, so understand that your grandfather lived in that world. Yeah, I, I, mean, okay? I saw that. <laughs> All right, yep. All right. And then you couple that with in science. Think about what the big TV shows were during that time. You had Star Trek, sci-fi wise, yes. Okay. Star Trek, yep. But then you had um, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Okay, yep. That was a very big show. Yep, yep. where they were always again overcoming things by taking things that you didn't have that didn't know how they work would you classify macgyver into that realm then macgyver grew out of that okay so macgyver actually came after i never even saw macgyver it was an 80s show yeah but by the 80s i was off working gotcha making money trying to be a <laughs> useful adult no useful money making adults <laughs> something it's hard for people to comprehend today um but before that, yeah. there was this whole, there were a, a series of shows. I'm trying to think what they are. I'm not but sure there were a number of shows where the whole thing was about how do you take one thing and turn it into something else? How do you make yeah. this do that? And then MacGyver became the embodiment of that, of something that had been running through the 60s that and 70s. That innovation yes. mindset. Okay. So it, it's, it's, you know, how can we take this to do something that it wasn't originally meant to do? Or how can we solve this problem using something that we can yeah. actually have ready access to that no one would ever use it for that purpose? Right. And so there's a whole lot of that. Plus, again, Michigan is where you build cars. Yeah. And in building cars, there's this whole thinking that goes on about how do we overcome this problem? We don't have this part. How can we manufacture this part? The supplier that supplies this part can't supply this part. Who else can make this part? Right. And and there were a lot of uh, small shops for years until it all went to China in Michigan specifically to deal with shortages of parts at automakers. Okay, so, I didn't know about that. Yeah, so the standard automaker couldn't produce it or they made it and it didn't pass specs. Who else can we get to make this part that we need? And I need some, I need them by Sunday. Right. You know, I need Very them by, by start of the day, Sunday, and it's Friday. Okay. So, Very rushed so order. who can I send this drawing to to cut this out and do it? And, and it happens even today. I mean, it still goes on today, yeah. not to the degree it did, but even today, that kind of stuff sure. goes on. And yes, I'm going to make a specialized part, and, and they're going to pay enormous amounts of money. So is that where your whole love and desire for science kind of came out of then? Was that TV it, show side of stuff, it, do you it, think? It, it's it's kind of a combination. Part of it was TV. Because the experimentation side, I think, Some is it, just what's really it, unique well, about yeah, it. Well, right. yeah, it was, it was the TV side, plus my father always, again, taking something and trying to figure out how you can do something with something that's yeah. not meant for that, okay, or creating something from scratch because we had tools, yeah. which was great. Um, and then, like I said, there was this other set of TV shows and I'm trying to think what they were. Um, I'm not sure. Not that dealt with science. Like well, those. what I'm thinking about is, um, man from uncle. Okay. okay? I've not seen that. You've one. never seen it. I know. I, I'd love to get the series. I really would like to get the DV series on DVD because, um, they always had these cute gadgets. And then you got to remember during that same time, that's when James Bond came on the scene. Yep. With all his gadgets. Okay. Okay? 
and so you had all this 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 stuff where yeah. people were were creating gadgets to uh, solve problems that are unique problems mm. and so there's this whole environment of that plus you had science plus you had so i'm curious would you say it's your love of innovation or your love of science that's greater i thought it was science i now think it's innovation it's 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 taking something that everybody always does and and doing it a little differently and doing it better that's why my whole thing with hydroponics is such a big deal for me is that my dad could grow plants okay he could grow a garden always grew a huge garden always gave away food um i don't have a garden i don't have space for a garden and i kill plants um the best i ever did was here in oregon with my tomato plant that uh the one year when i was living in the other apartment where we had a a little area here corn I, back I in georgia actually, Got it. And then, yeah, you had corn, but most of the corn didn't pan I mean, out. I'm not saying most of it pan out, but I remember we had but, fresh corn yeah, like, and, and a we few had, times. And, and we had some beans that yeah, I grew once. Beans. But trying to keep that stuff alive was just like to the, <laughs> the end of me. So, you know, with hydroponics, you know, I can mix formulas. I can measure things out. <laughs> now I've been spending years just trying to figure out how to properly measure it out. Yeah. And I think I, I finally... I think I'm finally understanding. I've had enough failures that I understand <laughs> what it's what, what I'm fighting, the beast I'm fighting, and I think I know how to beat it now. But we'll find out because I've I've said that before. I said that last year. I said that the year <laughs> before that. And the year before that. I'm like you've said that a couple of times, but yeah. okay. <laughs> I've said it a lot of times. Uh, but you know, we're, we we find more things. It's like it's like building the light bulb, Josh. There's I find more ways that. <laughs> You should not build a light bulb in more ways that you should not grow plants. So I'm curious for you, if it's if it's your love of innovation, where does like where do you connect to people better with? When someone talks about how they're innovating or when someone talks about like new scientific discovery stuff? Um, new scientific discovery doesn't really excite me. Because most of what is considered new scientific discovery today is theo theoretics. Theoretical stuff. Okay. Yep. And theoretical stuff, it's like we proved it and then you find out a month later, no, they didn't. And I, I just really am not interested. So you in that. prefer a tangible I want seeing somebody, yeah. physical I want somebody who has a real problem and needs to solve it somehow. Or I want somebody who has solved a problem. That nobody else could solve. And I'm interested, insanely interested in that. Okay. You know, I actually did accomplish this, and when we got done, it actually did work. That's what I'm interested in. Not this theoretical stuff, because the theoretical stuff, it's it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. You know, it's like the yeah. battery thing. You know, we've got batteries that will go through 10,000 cycles. Well, that's nice. Um, the fact that it's the size of a dime means a lot. Okay. Yeah. As to whether you're ever going to be able to use that or manufacture it, et cetera. Right. I mean, um, even QuantumScape with their solid state battery that we're talking about, you know, it's nice that they can make batteries. Um, I'm still questioning whether or not they can build them at cost. Right. You know, build them cheap enough with all the ma all the stuff that has to happen for that. So I'm curious. So has like electricity always been a fashion a, a passion or like interest of yours? Or is it kind of come and gone with the territories? Because I know you had like the little electrical kit that I yeah. played with back in the day that yeah. I really enjoyed. Yeah. Of like wiring the stuff together yeah. and figuring out, you know, like circuits and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. I, I love that. That's that was an amazing kit. Yeah. I wish yeah. they made those today. So, I mean, they might, but I, I, I they're not in Walmart at least. No, Fred Meyer's they're, they're or like any, the normal. No, they're not any stores. normal place. You've got to go just like Ohio Scientific or someplace like oh, that, that. But like that was like a really cool kit that I know you had when you yeah. were a kid. Yeah. Is that where you like have you always been in love with like the electricity dynamic of stuff since then? Or is that Well, electricity was the big thing when I came in. The before me, you had steam and then we moved to gasoline power. Right. And so Electricity was still just light. Right. Telephones on, you know, if you want to talk high tech, telephones um, and radio, you know. and There's there there quite a few things that use electricity, and, and, but and, and, it was and limited. TV was, was kind of in its infancy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
electricity was the next big field. Right. And so when they got TVs and we got tubes yeah. and radios and tubes, and then they started getting eliminating the tubes and going to solid-state transistors and all that kind of stuff, um, that was a huge revolution. Yeah. Huge. And I was on the beginning of that train. I mean, gotcha. I was at the very beginning. I was like one step removed from it, but yeah, very early on that train. And so it's just always been an, an excitement to you because it's been like the next frontier. Is that how you've seen it, or is it? Just... It's been what everything's moving to. Okay, you just see Every, that everything... as that's been the goal for the last fifty years, sixty right, years. Right, is... right. Well, you had gas. Yeah. And and the problem with gas is you had to get the engine to start. Yeah. And then it wouldn't start right. Because it wasn't getting the right amount of fuel. Right. And then there's the float. And, and you, you did small engine mechanics where you took yeah, it apart. Yeah, I did you small engine know repairs. All the, all the pieces. So, and the problem is, is those things were unreliable. They were yeah. horribly unreliable. And so you're always having to fix them. And the problem was, is why, why can't somebody just make a reliable small yeah. engine? And then the Japanese came along and they made a reliable small engine. <laughs> you know? And so that, that kind of fits. Or solved a lot of that of what you would use. So have you always like just been before. interested in more of like the engine kind of vehicle realm of stuff? Then, um, I don't know. I was interested in electric cars from the time I was about twelve. I wanted one. Yeah, and I could never get the math to work. They kept <laughs> saying the math worked. There's no reason we shouldn't have electric cars. We can do everything with electric cars that we with the batteries we have now. And every time I did the math, the math doesn't work, and I, I couldn't understand. You know, which is how 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 do you, how can you have an electric car yeah. when the math doesn't work? You know, it just yeah doesn't make sense. But um, but it, it electricity was the next frontier. So you know, you had circuits, and then you had we were just I was just at the beginning of the phase as um. Uh, a young teen of they were just making integrated circuits, the early integrated circuits. So you're taking a whole circuit board yeah. and putting it on a chip. So your love of computers and your love of electric vehicles have kind of been your two main driving passions for much of your life than when it comes to science. Yes. Is that pretty fair? Yes, yes. I've, I mean, I've wanted an electric car ever since I was, I don't know, 14, 15. And I think in general, granted, I think in general you've always – I don't know, from my, my experience, I feel like in general you've just enjoyed practical science in general. Correct. Correct. But, I, I want to solve real you know, problems. I don't want to sit around and pontificate about what life would be like if we had quantum computers. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. No, I, I, yeah. I, like, no you're a practical person. How can this make practically a work? Make a quantum computer. Show me what it actually does. And let's run it against other things yeah. that we, like, we really, like in real world, real, real people need to do. Yeah. You know? No, I totally get that. I just, I'm trying to. That's why, that's why from our, my standpoint, when I look at marketing, you know, I'm saying, how do we make marketing that works? What yeah, yeah. actually works no, it's, for it's people? No, it's the practicalness. You know, let, let's do something that is actually going to work for this person, not just what's the hype or what's cool or what the theory is. No, no, no. It's the practicalness. So what are some, so I want to, again, I want to stay focused on the, the connecting points, right? Mm-hmm. What are some other connecting points that you feel like you have with other people? Or like when someone talks about this or you meet someone who's like says this or things like this, like you just feel an instant connection with them. You feel like you understand each other. I don't know. I, I'd enjoy people that are just like doing stuff that I've never heard of. So the innovation side. Uh, yep. um, um, you know, the, the, you know, finding somebody who's doing something that I know nothing about. Makes for hours of great conversation. For okay, me. so what what's the conversation excitement for you though? The excitement for me is that I'm learning about something I didn't even know existed. But is it the curiosity? Or, and I didn't know that it was possible. Yeah, it's the curiosity. Okay, okay. So, but that, that, that's why I want to focus on, yeah, right? Yeah, it's the curiosity about something that's new. Because the thing is, is a lot of times people talk about something and they say, "Oh, this is," and it, and it's something way over here has nothing yeah. to do with any thing i'm doing and then after a while you find out that oh that might be the solution to right. one of the things that might be an option but the curiosity dynamic yeah. you and en you enjoy being curious yes 
would you say you enjoy other people who are curious, though, to you? To a degree. Okay. I'm more interested in what they're doing, okay. what they're accomplishing, what their so you're, struggles So you enjoy are. being around people who are able and willing to share about their, their, experience. their experiences. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's a very important difference, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So what are some other connecting points that connect you to people? I don't know. You're going to tell me. You're going to fill in the blank because I don't know. Um, I think being an eldest son's got to be a slight connecting point for you. Yeah, it is. It is. I being mean, the oldest child always, oldest of always, four. always, always, always puts you in a special spot. Yes. I, mean, I feel like being the oldest of four has to be a connecting point. You have to connect with some people and from time to time. Yes. I mean, there, there are definitely some struggles I know you talk about from time to time of, of being in that situation. Yes. Of like the the difficulties that the parents give you versus the other siblings because mm-hmm. you're the you're the as everyone says you're the test baby. Yes, we're the first <laughs> we're the first one, and and we're either always right or always wrong, or, and the next one is always always sure that they're getting cheated, and yep. they're getting more than what you're getting, and which is wrong. Yep, which is not that sense of entitlement right and fairness i think is something that you connect to people on which yeah. is very much a first child symptom yeah. often yeah because the second child thinks that he's getting taken advantage of but he's getting more than anybody else and will never admit yeah that they got more than everybody else so i think being an older brother probably has to be a, a dynamic for you that's a connecting point a little bit not a lot you don't feel like you and glenn butted heads a lot because from his perspective, you guys butted heads a ton. A ton, yeah. <laughs> like, but, I don't know how you but, perceive but, it, but from but, his perspective, but, you but guys were like. All, but that was all childhood. You know, I mean, understand, I'm, I'm over 60 now. So I've got over 40 years. Sure. 45 years out of that situation. That's fair. And that's, that's very different. Okay, that's fair. At, at this point in time. I mean, yes, when I was 20, it meant a lot. It was very much a connecting point. But now. So, I mean, I think that's another dynamic, though, that's a connecting point then. Is maturing past childhood holdups or childhood emotional baggage, I guess you could say. I haven't figured that one out yet. No. no okay. I haven't figured that out yet. So, not. Still that. working on that. Okay. So, still. still still growing as a person i think is yes. something that's really yes. a big connecting yes. point to you is, yes is... yes i don't want to be around stagnant people if you're perfect and you've reached perfection um i really don't have time for you i i want to be around growing people people that are growing getting better finding out other things that weaknesses that they have or problems that they have that are have been uh uh hurting or ruining their lives yeah and are trying to grow beyond those things or seeing, you know, things that they could do better and want to grow into those things. I don't want to be around stagnant people. So, I mean, I think that's a big connecting point for you. Yes, it's a huge connecting point. I mean, what was a connecting point for you with OEN? Let's ask that question. Um, Because I know I talked to you about them, but, like, what was the connecting point for you that got you excited about them? Basically everything you said, because you sold them really well. Okay, well, what did I say that, that sold it that you remember? Um, that they're doing what you had wanted to do with networking. Okay. As far as actually providing the proper, the resources that entrepreneurs need to be successful. Okay. And, um, across the board. So would you agree that you feel like you've not been given the resources needed for success in life? I would feel that way. Yes. Okay. I have all kinds of people telling me otherwise, but. But I'm saying like, that's a connecting point. Yeah. Right. Is feeling like you don't have the resources yeah. necessary. Yeah. Like that's a huge connecting point for you is if you ran to someone else who was like, I feel like I got everything down, but I just don't know the resources needed to get over the hump. Mm-hmm. You would connect to that person very well. Yes. Is that a fair yes. statement? Yeah. I mean, we all we all struggle with things and all struggle with different things. Yeah. And the the secret is is to know what you're struggling with. And that's what I think a lot of people miss is they they realize they're struggling and running in place, but they don't have the uh, awareness or they're not willing to reach out to others to ask for help to say, hey, 
you know, have the humility. And yeah. really, that's what it is. It's humility to say, hey, I'm struggling. What do you see that I can't see? Yeah. You know, because I'm, I'm concerned about what do people see that I can't see. Yeah. I mean, I know what I can see. I mean, that's fine. I got that under control. I'm working on that. I, I'm dealing with that. But okay. what do you see that I don't see? Okay. So back to connection points. I know we talked about your, your love of, like, growing stuff and your struggles of growing stuff. Like, that's yeah. a connecting point. Yeah. What are some other hobbies of yours that are, like, you have that are connecting points? That's the biggest one right now. Well, I mean, com- programming used to be, programming, uh, okay, used to yep. be a, a connecting point, and it still is for mm-hmm. me. I mean, um, somebody who doesn't know how to program. I, I mean, business owner is a connecting a, point for sure business, for you. Business owner, yep. Um, what about like sports? Sports, I never. It, Glenn was the sports guy, not me. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, like, I, was, I don't think I, you I, ever were a sports person. But I, like, I, 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 I tried sports, and it always ended badly. Okay. So you know, we just, I mean, we can throw a little ball around, and these days I'm up to volleyball. That's about the highest I can go. Yeah. Friendly volleyball, that is friendly volleyball. You know, not spiking people. <laughs> uh, volleyball. Um. Uh, but that's about the best I can do. Okay. What about? Okay. Here's one that I'm curious your thoughts on. What about when it comes to like um, interactions with other people? Like, what what interactions with other people bring you like joy versus bring you like disconnection? I get the most joy from people who are doing something that's new and unique. Again, that, that whole that's the big curiosity focus. thing, that the whole thing of, of learning something that you didn't know before. Okay. Realizing that there's some, a bigger world out there, or there's something going on that yeah. you're not aware of. So what about, what about this as a connecting point? Um, your kids playing sports. Was that important to you at all as a parent? Because each one of your kids played yeah. a sport, yeah, it was except it, for DJ. Yeah, I think it, she's the only one that was yeah, sportless. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it it it's important to me. Um, it's a connecting point of sorts. Um, but again, it, at this point, it's been a long it's, time. It's ago. beyond yeah. your focus. Um, what about? I mean, you're a grandfather. Does that? Do you feel like you connect to people in that dynamic at all? No. I do not. Because you don't, I know you don't really have like a good relationship with either of your grandkids. Well, any of your grandkids. You got one kind of area to have a fourth. But all in, all in the same house, all in the same roof. Well, all but one, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's not, um, that's been a very difficult okay. place. Um, okay, I've got one for you that I know you and I connected on. Uh-oh. Okay. I'm in trouble now. What about the Spock syndrome? Spock syndrome. Spock As in, syndrome. I know you and I talked about when I was younger about the Spock syndrome that every you feel like every kid goes through, right? That ends up being on the outside. No, only us nerdy people. <laughs> it's a nerd thing. Okay. Well, the nerd people nerd go thing. through yes. of feeling like you just don't want to have emotions because they're too strong to deal with. Correct. Do you still feel like you connect to people on that level? I connect with people over that, yes. Okay, what do you mean by that? I connect with the Spocks of the world. That's all <laughs> I can tell you. If you have troubles making friends and people get angry with you because you happen to say the wrong thing and you can't understand why they're flying off the handle, um, you and I should probably talk <laughs> because we probably have a lot in common. And we can probably get along very well. We could be friends. So that socially awkward person or that person that yeah. just doesn't quite seem to understand how to interact socially with certain situations. Yeah. Just tends we, to be a we, good we connection. We can get along. Point. We can get along. Yeah. We can we can connect. I think that's important, right? Because I think there, there are definitely probably people out there who feel like that. Well, according to the um, <laughs> well, actually, I know there are people emotion, out there not emotional put. intelligence, but the uh, what do they call it? The four quadrants. Okay. Uh, emotional quadrants. I know what you're talking. Yeah, twenty five percent of the population. 
falls into that group. So I can I can I can I can identify with that group. Okay. Um we have great conversations too. So what about rise and falls? Rise and life? falls. Do you feel like you can connect to people who can talk about that? Yes, definitely. As far as people feeling like they hit their peak and they're just on the way out? At, well, hit their peak or hit their bottom or are headed for one of the other. Yeah, I can I definitely identify with those people. Why? Oh, because I've been on both sides of that. Okay, how? I've been. I, I'm, I'm trying to get you I to mean, share it because I don't want to talk about it because it, I know it's, you don't it's, like it's talking very, it's about very it. It's very painful. It's very painful, but I've been. And I think this I've, is the I've emotional in, conversation been, but, that makes the connection. Well, but I've been in com- in situations where I've had nothing and been very qu- close to being homeless. And homelessness was like looming over my head. It's like this dark cloud. Um, and then I've had other times where it's like everything is going great and everything looks like it's going great. And then it didn't. And then it didn't. <laughs> And it didn't. It just poof, disappeared. So you know, like I, I get those. I get, I get that. I would I say, that. do you also under? I think you also would understand the dynamic of like a business of starting out and the high of the business and the low of like it not panning out the way you intended. I think you would agree with that statement. Yeah, you need to read <laughs> the ro- the uh, books right here. <laughs> The entrepreneurial, the entrepreneur roller coaster, uh, by Darren Hardy, fantastic book. Talks about it, explains it in <laughs> great detail. Yes, today you're on the top of the world. You've made a sale. Everything's good. Everything's beautiful. Tomorrow, you can't make sell anything, and your business is about to close. <laughs> yes, know a lot about the entrepreneurial roller coaster. Okay. I can very much identify with it and and have a good bit of compassion. So I'm glad you brought him up. So let's let's move into that. So what are some big, um, we'll call them influencers just to make it simple. What are some influencers that you feel like other people, if other people knew them as well, you would be able to connect with them very easily because you would have a very similar mindset or understanding because of some of the stuff. So Darren Hardy, I'm sure, is one of them because you follow his yeah. stuff very closely. Right now. Currently, yeah. Um, Dan Kennedy, I'm assuming, would be another one. Yeah, to a degree. To a degree. I mean, really, anybody who is reading books on business. But in general, like, anybody who. But I want you to think of, like specific people, though, that you've like. Yeah, but I'm admired. saying anybody who's who's doing coaching, I've I've always had really good. Right, but again, I want you to think of like specific individuals who people might be able to register with right like Um, like for me right like i I always talk about gary v grant cardone those are two very big ones that you know people from my generation when i say gary v grant cardone most people in the business community from my generation or in the sales community from my generation know those two names right right and they recognize those two names and those are like synonymous with yeah well my current with that culture well i've had different different ones at different times (laughs) and 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 people at different places and the problem is is that the people that have Helped other people, okay? Like Jim Rohn was so like Jim, my, yeah. Jim Rohn's I know okay, one that you would classic, connect with. Classic very is quickly. Jim Rohn. If you haven't heard Jim Rohn, go to YouTube, look up Jim J I M Rohn R O H N. There's all kinds of videos and audios on there um, with his. But like as, he's, as people are saying, he's a big influencer. I know yeah, for your life, right? So, well, because he's a big influencer for almost anybody who's anybody right now. I mean, Darren Hardy, okay. He was a mentored by Jim Rohn. Well, and then there's the, um, also the guy that mentored Jim Rohn that you talked about that you like. Yes, uh, Brian Tracy, right? No, Brian Tracy. Um, or no, is a is it contem- Brian Tracy? Brian or is Tracy it the other is one? a contemporary to Jim Rohn. Who was the guy before Jim Rohn? There was another guy that you talked about. Yes, his his uh, show was uh, was his mentor. Okay, and there's a few recordings out there of of show of show. Uh, but very, very little. Okay. And guys, almost unheard of. So Jim Rohn's but the Jim main Rohn one. But Jim Rohn was the main one. But if you look at Tony Robbins, his rise to fame was through Jim Rohn. Yep. His coach was Jim Rohn. So um, Jim Rohn has really, anybody who's in personal development today has 
more than likely heard him or been a direct student of his at some point. So Jim time. Rohn, though, would be a big influencer for you then. Yes. Like, connection with people. Yes. yes. I, I just want to make sure, yeah. like, yeah. we're all and the same And most people, most people can, will connect with Jim Rohn because he's just a simple country boy, um, no college, um, trying to make it as an entrepreneur and did. So, so Jim Rohn's a big one. Uh, any other influencers you feel like have been really impactful on your um, like really good connection points? Like someone mentions yeah. that name, you're just instantly like, I know what they think or I know what they like yeah. and care about. Um, I'm I'm growing. Um, the guy from Shark Tank that you gave me, um, Damon John. Damon John. He's kind of growing on me. Okay, growing on me. I I I I've had this kind of love hate relationship with him, but um, <laughs> he's growing on me. I mean, he, I read his Power Shift book. And I kind of feel like the title doesn't match the book, but I got a lot out of the book. The okay. book was really, really good. good. Um, and anybody who reads it, um, I would love to have their opinion of the book. I know Bob Iger's one. Books-wise, Bob Iger. Yeah, Bob Iger, um, again, his really story um, was really interesting to see his perspective. And then um, I forget who the fellow was for GM, the CEO of GM I don't for all those years. Uh, I know you're talking about the beans and car, yeah. or car beans. Car guys, car guys versus bean, bean counters, counters yeah. is the name of the book. Car guys versus bean counters. One of about five or six books he wrote, but he wrote about GM and um, the uh, auto industry while he was there at GM as, as an executive. And um, so I guess that would be another good point. Is his that... his his view on the UAW and my view of the UAW are 180 degrees perfectly opposite. It's very interesting. Okay. Very I didn't interesting. Know that part. Yes. Yes. Um he saw the UAW in a very different light than what I saw. Okay. Um or I thought I experienced. Okay. Fair enough. So um yeah. So uh But that one. Any yeah. other books that you would say are like big impactfuls for you? Oh boy. I know there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. Um just try to think of like We'll say two more books that you think were big impactfuls for you. Um, one of the ones I like the best uh, is uh, fa not fascinate. Fascinate is um, it's called. It starts with the C, and it means the idea of everybody's catching on to it. Um, yeah, I'm not it's sure. been a while since I've read it. I'm sorry. I had a, I, I when I was reading these, I I was yeah. right on boom boom. I can I tell gotcha. you. Um, but it's been a little while for some of them, and uh, but there's there's just a whole slew. Oh, um, the E myth. That's a great one. Okay, E myth's a big e -myth one. E myth is a big one. Um, the business of the 21st century by um. I know I recognize the title. I don't know who wrote business, it. Business. It's the uh, I. The guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Kiyosaki? Kiyosaki, yes. Okay. Business of the 21st Century, like that. That's a great one because it's actually what he talks about in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He tries to show you by the analogy, you know, yeah. as a story. But he talks about it directly as business. Okay. And, and how, how those principles play out and what they look so, like. Um, so real quick. We, I, we're, we're running a little bit long. I want to kind of get through this real quick. So – um, what about TV shows? Any TV shows other than like Star Trek, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, uh, Uncle? Would you say Man name? from Uncle? Man from Uncle. Any other shows that you feel like were very impactful connecting points for you? Leave It to Beaver's got to have been somewhat impactful to you. No, really, almost never watched Leave It to Beaver. See, I I came just after Leave It to Beaver when mm. we finally got a TV. My dad okay. broke down, and got a TV. Brady Bunch. Uh, Brady Bunch, yeah. Okay. Was Bunch. that impactful to you at all? I don't know, but I watched it every day. <laughs> you know, Batman was more impactful because Batman always had some kind of gadget okay. to get him out of whatever the problem so was. So gadgets have always been like a fascination yes. of yours. Yes. Is, is, that's, why, uh, that's why Around the World in 80 Days uh, with David Niven. So the one on VHC that yes. we used to have? Yes. There's no gadgets. Yeah, there's no gadgets, but he's always got the right. He's got money, or he's bought something, or whatever. 
and there was a c- cartoon after it. And in the cartoon, they would always put in the bag what they needed for the day. See. Okay. So there, it was it was it went beyond just the original movie. Okay. Anyway, any any other TV shows you feel like were really impactful um, or have been really impactful for you? Um, that's all I can think of right now off the top of my head. But. Right, how about movie genres? So I know sci-fi is pretty big. Yeah. I know you were into the Avengers stuff and like Iron Man and whatnot. Yeah, well, we were always into that to some degree because we had actually comic books. I don't know, it's hard to believe. Comic. I didn't have that they many. Actually, they're, they're actually really but, popular nowadays still. Yeah. They're actually expensive now. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they're actually 20 times the cost of back then. Okay. Um, <laughs> There's like a 200% markup, 2,000% markup on some of them. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I the, the superhero stuff I always liked as a kid. Um, where they've kind of taken it today, I'm not so as thrilled. As thrilled. But the original comic stories of superheroes is a connecting point. Yes. So yes. you would connect to someone well, talking about the original well, backstories yeah. of Well, if you look at the old Superman, I didn't realize that Superman goes all the way back to the 50s. As far as the show or the comic book, the the t- the animated TV series. That's that's the 30s and 40s. Okay, 30s and 40s. World War two time yeah, period. Yeah, yeah, 30s and 40s. Yeah, but anyhow, pretty su- sure it's the 30s. Superman I know the 40s goes all the sure. way back to there, and those still exist. Yeah, they're on DVD. That's how yeah. I know it was the yeah, 40s. Yeah, but but I mean, they <laughs> yeah, I'm, pretty sure I, it's I'm the shocked 30s they too. still exist, and they're still as interesting as the Superman that I watched. Okay. On TV. So, who was your favorite superhero so, as a kid? Then, um, probably Superman. Superman, or Batman. But those two were probably like the Batman. main ones you followed. Bat- Superman when I was younger. Batman when he came out in the sixties. Oh, I didn't realize he was that new. Yeah. Okay. He came out in compared the 60s. to Superman. If you're saying, I didn't realize he was that yeah. new. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So you are you are a Superman fan, and then you turned into a Batman fan yeah. when Batman became a little bit more popularized. Yeah. Well, you no, know, just. When Batman came out, okay. because he had gadgets. So was that Superman didn't have? Was gadgets. that the comic book versions though, or was that like the the, the TV show? So the TV show. Style. I came home from school every day and I watched Batman. <laughs> that was the most important thing to get home in time so to watch, watch Batman. Batman. Okay, gotcha. And it was in color. It wasn't black and white. It was in color. That was even better. So that would be a huge connecting point for you, though. Then for other people, as other people who could relate to. The whole Batman vibe and wanting to come home from school to watch a TV show. Yeah. Slash specifically watching Batman. Yes. Not I mean, SpongeBob. Batman. <laughs> I mean, I say that just because, I mean, I, I think the hardest thing for a lot of business owners is they run into what you're running into right now, which is this block of like, what are connecting points I have with other people? Um, yeah. And, and And as we go, we're like building more and more. So I want to do another one that I think is important that I just briefly want to touch on, which is business-wise. You understand what it's like to spend money and not get the result you wanted. Yes, I do. And you understand what it's like to spend money and get the result you wanted? I know what it's like to spend money and get some of the result I wanted. Okay. Because if I really got the result I wanted, I would have (laughs) a a different situation. Okay. So you feel like you've spent money and gotten some of the result and never gotten the result. Mm-hmm. And you feel like you've struggled to spend money and get the result you really wanted. Yes. And I have a new rule that says I will never buy another business. <laughs> never buy another business. It's a, it's always a loser. There's always – I don't care how honest you always. think they are. There's always hidden stuff. It, it's a bad deal always. <laughs> bad so experiences. If you want to eliminate competition, okay, that's fine. But – it's always a bad deal. Um, bad, bad a, personal very, experiences. Very, very I, I could argue with that so many times, so many different examples, but I get it. Bad, bad experience. All I can tell you is for me. So, I, I mean, that's another business. experience you've had is you've bought an organization. I bought two businesses in my life. And both were bad two. purchases. Yes. They were both bad. Which two? I only knew of net perking. Yeah. There, I bought a, um, a, uh, Open systems accounting software company. When? Back in Georgia. Okay, I'm like, this must have been a while ago because I've yeah. not heard this story. Yeah, I know you haven't. You weren't around for it. It's okay. <laughs> here's the an- Here's the short end of the stick. It was a bad deal. I paid way too much money. 
for something that wasn't worth anything close to what it was. It was a waste. Period. Okay. So you know so and, and that's the other thing I real quick want to talk about. You also know what's like to have multiple businesses and to not have them work out. Yes. How many businesses have you attempted to have? I think we're on number six. So is that seven. including net perking or not including net perking? Including net perking. I think that's or I think that's why I'm saying six or seven. And is that in including there. marketing with D or not including marketing with D? I that's what I'm saying. That's that's the six and seven. <clears throat> okay. So we're on that's that's either with the two of those, it's with either four unnamed businesses that were of various types that I had over the years, or um I think there's there's either four of those which would make those two six, or there's five of those, and I'm missing one. I'm pretty sure there's five of them. Okay. I can't think what they all are, and that makes them six and seven. Okay. So, so you, dynamic marketing <clears throat> collaboration is seven. Is number seven. Yeah. Okay. So you know what it's like to have six failed businesses. Yes. Attempted failed businesses. Yes. And to still keep going. Yes. You know what it's like to constantly feel like, you don't know what you're missing. Yes. Is, is that a fair assessment? Yes, that's a fair assessment. You know what it's like to yeah. be like, I know I'm missing someone, but I can't figure out what it is. Correct. Would you say it's a fair assessment that you know what it's like to feel like it's within grasp to be very successful, but you don't know what you're missing to actually make that happen? Yes. Would you agree that you know what it's like to be scared that you might be within grasp of success? I know what it's like to be terrified of success, to actually see success coming, or at least what looks like success coming, and be scared to death that it might actually happen. Yes, I do. Like, <clears throat> I want you to touch and on just that so real you quick. Know, that's the worst fear of all. I want you to touch on that real quick. Do you, would you say you've had nightmares about that? No. Or like, no, 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 no nightmares. Just every time I think about it, just shaking and, and getting all, you know, like how you go to talk in front of people and you get all nervous and shaky and, and you just, yeah. and you can't think of anything. That I mean, I can't feeling. say I, I don't think of anything, but, but yeah. But I mean, but I'm a, a lot different of people, person, lot of people yeah. have that and that's what it feels like. Okay. It's like, I'm going to succeed. This could actually work out. I could actually, yeah. And, and it holds a lot of people back. It holds. A lot of people who could have very successful businesses back. That fear of success. Of yep. like, I don't know if I want to feel that almost. Uh, of that, it's just different. I, 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 I'm going to be different. If things are going to be different now. Things yeah. are going to – I don't know how to handle that. I don't know what – do I really want this now? I would also say you're probably someone who also understands the value of I, I would know say the value of good advice. I would say stuff is the best way I could word it, right? Okay. The value of like caring about the belongings you have and and right taking maintaining care, right. And taking care of what you have. Yes, you also are someone who understands the value of appropriate finances, not frivolous spending. I guess would be another way to word yes. that. Yes, right. I'm sure you can connect to a lot of people who are efficient with their spending. Yes, but you don't connect well with people who are CFO analytics only people is that fair they and i can find a place of we can get along okay okay i don't think we'll ever be close dearest friends even <laughs> though i have some that have tried um but we we can we can get along um, what are some other things that you care about that you think are connecting points for you with people? I know people is one thing, right? Like you care about companies that, and people in general who care about other people, like that's a big factor for you. Yeah. I know that was a big factor with you and mom was like, you, you appreciate whether you admit it or not. You did appreciate the like caring, this dynamic that she had. Uh -huh. Um, for me, a lot of it is just, is respect, just respecting yeah. others and, and, Respecting your employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think respect has kind of fallen in the streets these days. 
Okay, so respect's a big one for you. Yeah, respect is is kind of kind of gone anymore, and it, it's like you know, if that person's not in our group, then we have the right to disrespect them, and that's just not that's not right. Regardless, so above of all, where respect above all else. Yeah, treat them as a human. I guess would be a better way to word well, it. Well, well, that's the problem is that when you disrespect, what you do is you dehumanize. Yeah, and that's the problem with this whole thing of stereotypes and and we talk about racism but what we don't realize is that racism is racist and and it, it is all dehumanizing yeah and anything that dehumanizes people in my book is wrong yeah i don't care what label you give it it's wrong and a lot of people have troubles with that because from my point of view you know it cuts both ways is it, you, I, I don't care how you dehumanize the other person. I don't care how wrong their opinion is. That doesn't give you the right to dehumanize them. And, and that's where I have. And that's a big connecting point for you with people. Yeah. Is people who get that, like, you can disagree and still see them as a human being first. Correct. And their disagreement second. Correct. Versus people who want to put the disagreements and agreements first and the human part second. Well, the disagreement beca- decide makes you allows you to decide whether or not that person's a human or not. Right. I, I think that's I think that that's something that is definitely probably a really big connecting point for you with people. I mean, and, and it's definitely something that's big for me as well. And I got it from you. I know. Hey, well, I am mom. You know, I, I you know put the human first, mm-hmm. right? Human element yeah. first, everything else second. Yeah. No, I, I I think that's a good point. Uh, any anything else that you can think of? No, I think like, you've you pretty much beat me to death. I mean, there's so much more though. That's the, that's the problem I'm having with you. It's like there's so much more. Like, you know what it's like to be part of a chamber of commerce. That's a connecting experience. Yes, you know, know what, it's what it's like, like to be part of multiple chamber of commerces. No, I've only been a member of well, one I chamber of commerce. I thought you were commerce. part of uh, more than one at one time. No, I never. Just I, networking. I was always and, loyal. And I was the, always and loyal to my one. Those were the yeah. only two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I considered. I considered. Giving up my loyalties, but okay. I I never pulled that trigger. You know what it's like to be in a BNI chapter, not a part of it, but like to go to yep. one of their meetings. Yep. I'm familiar with the organization. You're familiar with Latip. You're familiar degree. with Latip. Yep. Um, what are other experiences you've had as a business owner? There are connecting experiences where you can be like, yeah, I know what that was like. Well, other groups that are like those two groups. I mean, there are a number of other groups. Are there other groups that you've been a part of? Yes, you've experienced? yes that I've, I've been a part of. Um, I've seen really good things come out of them. I've seen really bad things come out of them. And I've seen, I'm still trying to figure out what works and right. what doesn't. You know, what tends to work best in those groups is somebody who has a very simple, straightforward business. Like if I'm a painter, you know, you can hire me to paint your room. Yeah. And that's pretty pretty easy that um if i was a mover you know i could move stuff sure. for you or help you move um what gets harder is things like insurance um yeah uh, you know real estate real estate loans so what are some let me ask you this question what are some common struggles you feel like you've had that other business owners have had i've had I know just keeping your everything. booking straights one yeah bookkeeping um, Remembering to do your up, bookkeeping, keeping up with your records, um, but I always, I, I got pretty much for the most part, always uh, got ahead on the record stuff. I never let it go like a lot of people do. Well, I know you don't let it go years, but you let it go, you know, six months. Well, I, know, I have, four or six I have, but then... I, I still keep track of the receipts and everything I yeah. need to keep track. Of. Okay. Um. But um. But okay. But you know, I understand the the, the struggles of, of trying to you know or of trying to move forward and then yeah. having to look at your budget and say, Well, do I really have the money to move forward? And that that's one of those places where like from an accounting standpoint, I don't think a lot of business owners keep missing the, the thing is as I look at my checking account and I say I've got money. But just because your checking account has money doesn't necessarily mean you have money. Well, and I, to that point, I think you also understand the like cyclic na- cyclic nature of starting a business initially. Yes. As far as the like the up and down of like I may have money for the you know right now, and it may seem like I have all the money I need, 
if I just keep this up. But you may go for three, four months without bringing in another paycheck, yeah. you know, or two months without bringing another paycheck. And yeah. all suddenly that money that seemed really great now is having to get stretched out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's just spits and starts and stops and, and spits and starts and all that. And then there's the people who, you know, everything's cooking. I know I got it. I met, met a bunch of people. Yep. Everybody wants what I do. This is great. And then a month later, six weeks later, everybody's used your service that yeah. you know, they know, and you're, you're done. So, I mean, I real quick want to touch on two more connecting points while I'm thinking about them. Um, so I can spice and dice this to try to have all of them. Um, you know what I was like. Well, do you remember what it was like post-Vietnam War being in the U.S. as an American? Yeah. Or was that kind of like beyond you a little bit? No, I was involved in it. Yeah. So you would you say you could connect to other Americans who like witnessed what you guys witnessed on TV and saw mm -hmm. the like – because that was the first time news media, from my understanding, really portrayed war the way that they did during the Vietnam War. Like but, in, in the negative light and the first-person realms and the like graphicness that they did. But it was worse than that. And, and you have to talk to the people who were there, who experienced the war firsthand, to understand. Because it was worse than that. It, it, it was everything from people fighting to take over the same hill yeah. month after month, um, going out and so-called cleaning out an area of the um, Viet Cong, and then turning around the next week, going back and cleaning out the same area. Yeah. Um, and just all the all the various things that um, happened during that war and yeah. all the different pieces. Um, you know, I had a neighbor who was older than me. He was a teenager, so I, I think he's probably five, would have been about five years older than me, who died in the war. No, you never told me that one. Yeah. He, uh, he ran one of the dog crews. For finding the underground tunnels, yeah, so they yeah. used the dog to find the smell of the air coming out of the underground tunnel, and then find it. And then once they found it, <coughs> dig it up, and they would booby trap around okay. the tunnels after a while. Right. And he died due to one of those booby traps. Yeah, you never told me that story. Yeah. I don't. I don't tell all <laughs> everything. I wasn't that. I wasn't that close to him, but his 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 parents lived across the street. Yeah. A little yeah. two bedroom house. Across the street, I yeah, mean, yeah. not here. Across the street, over there. Across the street, right? That's crazy. My dad taught him as a as a as one of his students. Had him was one of his students. Yeah. What was that like for your dad? Because I know your dad was in the Korean War, right? Yes. Like he yeah. he actually fought in the Korean War, I should say. Yeah. Well, he was an MP. Okay. I don't know. If Military he police. Or, no, I know what yeah, that is. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. I don't know if he fought in the war necessarily, but no, I know he was in during the war. Yeah, no, he was an MP, and, and what he told me is that he, his his big thing for that was we're always supposed to be there looking to try to find out something, to find find something, even though we're not supposed to be looking like we're looking around, but we're supposed yeah. to be looking around. And that was his big thing that we're kind of in under cloak and dagger, but I don't know that he had much cloak and dagger. But, I mean, how was the Vietnam War like for him then? Did he talk about it at all? Or was that a discussion at all around with the family? We had Cause that's gotta discussions, been but different it, for him, being having been in the military, having been a teacher, because he had been a teacher for many years at that, or several years yeah, at least at that point. Yeah. So, I mean, he... Um, yeah, he was a teacher for a long time at that point, but... Um, I'm sure that wasn't his only student who went it, off to the war, I guess is what I'm saying. Um... There were a few. There were a few from the area. A fewer than you would think. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, it was a smallish yeah. town, too, yeah. though. So, um, a lot fewer than you would think. Um, the way the war started was just so weird. Yeah. Okay. Um, At least from your guys' perspective. Yeah. And, and the, it's one of those things where the longer it ran, the worse it was. Yeah. And the more nobody wanted to go. Yeah. Kind of thing. And there was just so much negativism. And then you had the whole black thing. And that was happening at the same time? At the same time, okay. yes. Um, they overlapped. Um, 
and there was just so much noise that um, uh, sometimes it just everything got drowned out. And and to really comprehend the war, you have to talk to people who were in the war. Yes. Um, to even begin to get a perspective, because what was portrayed on TV is so no, no, I, outside I, I, yeah. of, of of what what it should have been, and then various things that were brought up were so far beyond. Do you feel like? America felt more chaotic then than it has since? I think we're actually at a place that is more chaotic now really? than it was then, yes. Do you think it's more chaotic, or do you think it's just the way that things are portrayed? No. It, well, it's the way things are – part of it's the way things are portrayed, but right now there, I mean, there's, there's I, a lot I more ask, chaos. I ask just because inherently the Vietnam War, I think, was the most controversial war ever in American history. Right, I it mean, was. I mean, and it should be. It it was, but back then, the people who served in the armed forces were respected. Today, not when they came home. And when there's all they, kinds of stories of Vietnam vets getting completely disrespected. I mean, worse than. Yeah, but a lot of that was because they didn't know they were Vietnam vets. A certain portion of it. Other things were due to things that happened during the war. Well, there were things that and happened during the not, war that the news. From my understanding, at least, and that's why I was curious your thing, is that from my understanding, the news portrayed certain things that happened in the war as if, like, everyone partook in this horrible task yeah. or this horrible yeah. situation, which yeah. was not... Not at all true. Not not a reality, right. but everyone kind of got labeled a baby killer. Everyone got labeled yeah. a, you know, a, a yeah. murderer or this yeah. and that, even though those things were... Right. Yes, they happened, right. but they weren't but it, everyone it, that but was there. But it depended on who you were, where you were, and so yeah, on. Yeah. We were in the Midwest. And so we were very much behind so you feel like the people. In that location, you guys were still very pro-military yes. and respectful. Of yes. Them. Okay. Okay. Um, other places, there was less. But where we were, it was very, very respected Okay. at that time. The problem was is that you knew you weren't getting the true story on the news after right. a while. And nobody knew what the real story was. Gotcha. Because there was no alternative way to communicate things out. Right. And it wasn't until 20 years later that gotcha. the reality of what really happened, why certain things were, were done the way they were yep. done, actually started coming out. Gotcha. And then there could be some healing. Right. But the problem was is it was 20 years later. Yeah. I mean, that's a long time. Do you feel like that was impactful to you then? Do you think that's been impactful to you in general as far as that, like, seeing that patriotism come and go over the years? Because, I mean, when you were really young, right, mm -hmm. when you were first born, you know, during the early 60s and mid-60s, you know, the whole, like, space race and Kennedy, there was a lot of patriotism, I feel like, across the country, or at least portrayed Correct. patriotism, No, there was right? patriotism. There was downright patriotism, yes. Right. And then you saw during the Vietnam War and the race riots the, the, the downgrade of that patriotism and the almost like, well, I don't want to say hatred of America, but, but just a, 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 well, a degradation of unity. It was, it was a, there was a loud, the way we perceived it is there was a group that was very loud and very anti-patriotic. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's what they were, is a loud group that was anti-patriotic. Now, but, but real quick, so you saw that, and then you saw the rise of the 80s and the Reagan era and the Carter eras, which were very, like, unifying again, I feel like. America, the, the, the Reagan I feel like era, the, Nixon, the, the Nixon Watergate trials caused some, like, distrust, and then you had uh, the Reagan and Carter and even Clinton to a degree, which kind of brought back this almost you, I don't want to say unity, but this like Reagan did more to bring unity across hope. I guess yeah. is how I would describe yeah. it. Yeah, Reagan. Was hope. Reagan was more for unity and hope. Um, Carter was more of hey, the, the, the Democrats have always had this agenda <laughs> that we've wanted to run, and we're going to run that agenda, and we don't care what the results are. Okay, I I just feel like under and, Carter, and, and from my perspective, under Carter, that. it was a very mellow presidency. 
because, from my understanding. Because he was fought at every turn. Gotcha. But it just seems like the, the country wasn't at war with itself. No. Right? And no. then, if the, like from my perspective, it seems like, you know, from my childhood memories that I can remember, I remember, like, the Bush, the Bush era's kind of leading into this whole, like, divide again to a degree. Well, and then we but, had 9-11 happen, which then caused, I mean, unity across America like we've not seen yeah. in a very long time. Right. You know, and we saw a very high level of unity for, you know, four, five, six years. And then we kind of saw as the wars drag on this continual breakage. Yeah. Well, and like, then Obama's right, got right. into office, and there was right. some unity, some breakage, right. and then it just kind of seems to have just continued to have gone back into this left field of just it's downward hopelessness. Spi- right, downward building, spiral, yes. Right. right. Yeah, no. Um, well, you got to understand, remember at 9-11, I don't know if you remember me telling you kids that this war is going to go on for I 20 barely, years. I barely remember 9-11. So. Okay, when 9-11 <laughs> happened, I told you kids that this war was going to go on for 20 years. Okay, to, to, to deal with this, it was going to be 20 years. And I think it was 23 when... Um, when we officially pulled out? When we officially pulled out of the last... 21. 21? Okay. 21, 23. Yeah. No, it was 21. Because last 21. year was okay. a one-year anniversary. Okay. 21. This year will be year two anniversary of the, okay. the so, deaths. Okay, so 21 years. Um, uh, yeah, just I, over 20. But I was well, guessing... But yeah, I was, yeah, I was guessing 20. Okay, so a little more mm-hmm. than, than what I guessed. But that's what I saw, okay, at that time. No, it would have been 20 and, exactly because it wasn't until 01 that the okay. bombings happened. Okay. So exactly so, 20 years. Okay, so that, so what you have to understand is that was my prediction based yeah. on the Vietnam War and what mm-hmm. I saw in the Vietnam War and how it dragged on and what was propelling it. Right. And it being just a single country, we're here. It was a whole series of countries. Right. And people across a whole series of Well, that was the perception. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, there's, it, it, there, yeah, there's yeah. a whole other thing that. Yeah, we can get into it. My a military brain wants to, like, jump on. My marine yeah. brain wants to jump on, too, and be like, no, 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 this is actually how it was. But right. <laughs> different conversation. Yeah, but different conversation. But, but my point is, is that, that that's how I saw it. Yeah. And what I saw, you know, for instance, um, there was I was in the uh, car uh, dealership getting my car work done, yeah. the oil change or something, and uh, a woman from the local uh, military base in the yeah. area came in and said, "No one would, none of them would stand with President Bush. Never no want to be caught on camera with President Bush." Okay. And they had troubles trying to get people to be President Bush, and my my, my mind went back to the Vietnam War, and that would have never <laughs> happened. Regardless of who the president was, Democrat, Republican, whatever, you would have never had that conversation. And anybody who had that conversation with anybody would have been immediately court-martialed. Yeah. And here this person could come in and say that and not be court-martialed during Desert Storm. Right. Um, and, you know, my perception is very different from my father's perception. My father was very much against Desert Storm. I was very much for Desert Storm because I felt like it was – us fighting the war over there where we at least have military training and all yeah, yeah. versus fighting them over here where right. we don't. Um, but that's my own perception of, of, of how, how things went down. And part of that also, again, comes from Vietnam and what I experienced from Vietnam right. and, and what I saw happen inside the country outside the country and so on so it's it's so would you say that vietnam war is a big impact for you on your perspective towards war and like american patriotism it is but i don't know exactly that i could qualify it and quantify it yeah, I mean, yeah. i've never sat down and said well how does how did the <laughs> vietnam war really affect how i thought about things or how i perceive things i i never have had that conversation with myself no, but, I get you've never had that but, question, but, but just the, the more rea- we talk about the reality, it, the more it seems like but the it, reality is is that I it, did it, have a big it, it developed certain certain beliefs. One of yeah. them is is that you know you need to support 
your troops and you can't be fighting the president and everybody else under the sun and then say you're supporting the troops. Right. Because when they did that in the Vietnam War at the end, right, it undermined the troops, it undermined everything, and it made me sick to my stomach. And people don't, so don't you appreciate say, that, don't you understand that. Appreciation of like our military and like what they're willing to do is a pretty big factor for you. I think appreciation of our military and what they are asked to do. Because nobody wants to talk about the restrictions placed on them. Because, see, I talk to people who actually were in Vietnam. Yeah. Again, 20 years later, 30 years later. And the stories they tell about how things actually happened and what needed to be done and how the generals and so on would never allow them to do the yeah. things that would actually be effective. Yeah. And it wasn't until they started doing a few things that were effective that it actually made ending the war a possibility. Yeah. But again, they didn't do. And then the same thing happened in the Viet at the end of the Vietnam War that happened at the end of uh the war with uh in Afghanistan when we pulled out. Um well, as far as the mass center, exodus and the mass exodus and then the other side coming in and taking over the city yeah. before we had a chance to evacuate everyone out. Yeah. Exact same thing. Exact same nonsense. I didn't realize that. I never like thought yeah. of the two together. But yeah, you're right. It, it literally was and, the exact and, same. <laughs> and for that's, me, that's actually, and for me, that's, that's a funny. very, very hurtful. Do you think it it makes you feel like there's no hope, or how's that like? How's that make you feel? Because that's got to make you feel some type of way to like. It's not hopeless. It's that I have a very low regard for our our people who are in office. The top brass or the political Pre officials? I'm talking about the president. Okay. Gives so, me a very negative opinion of of uh, Biden. Of the president. Yeah, yeah. Extremely negative opinion of him. That's interesting. Because it's the same nonsense that we should have learned from Vietnam. You know, you, you have yeah. a war, and it's bad that things bad ha things happen in a war. But they didn't. Or like, just like you noticed at the end of the war, we had 13 Marines killed. Why do we have 13 Marines killed? Because they didn't follow the procedures that had been established earlier on in yeah. that whole process. See, that's interesting to me because I don't want to go into too much detail. But, see, it's interesting to me that you blame the president. See, I go the opposite way, actually. And, and I guess it's probably just due to my, my, my route. I feel like there's a, a connotation that's played in movies that I truly do believe and, like, I experienced in my time. Officers are going to be idiots regardless. Like, that's just the reality of it, right? Just the, the nature. Just so you know, this is the perception of the guy who's actually on the ground having to catch bullets, <laughs> you know, and or. And, I mean, and, and just so you know, everybody's always felt like this forever. No, I agree. And I, but I mean, I truly do believe this. And, I, and I've seen it witnessed multiple times with different officers. I think the best officers are the ones who know how to support and know how to lead by being a bridge, not those who know how to lead by telling. Mm -hmm. I think the officers who try to tell people what to do just don't understand what it takes. Like, that's just the mm -hmm. reality. Don't tell me how to do my individual task. Tell me what task needs to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. Right. And so to me, I don't blame the officers for what happened. I don't blame the, the president or anything like that. The people I blame, and I, I mean... Maybe we, should, maybe we should just leave it. Well, no, no, no. I have to strike this, but, but like, I got told, and, like, I really want to go back to my unit right now, because I got told, apparently, one of the fucking sergeants who was there uh, is at my unit now, my old unit. And I don't want to go there just so I can fucking bitch her out. Because, to me, I blame her and every other fucking NCO that was there for what happened. Because the officers, I don't expect them to know what the hell they're doing. They're officers. Like, I'm sorry, I don't expect that. The damn NCOs... We say they're the backbone of the Marine Corps for a freaking reason. And the fact that the backbone of the Marine Corps didn't use their own intelligence, didn't use their own, you know, freaking guts, lose rank. I like I, I really don't care. Like I mean it's the one thing I've always told people. The reason why I will go back in if there's a war is because I'll be willing to lose rank over saving people because I know the fucking difference. 
like mm-hmm. I, I got trained and brought up in an environment as in a you know mindset of, of NCOs that understood that you take care of the Marines and you make sure they come back and you train and you operate from that perspective, everything else second. Yeah. And I feel like the current generation just doesn't have that mindset, that warrior mm-hmm. mindset, nor that we're going to bring people home mindset. And I blame the NCOs, though, not the not the officers. The officers are the last ones I, I worry about. It's the NCOs and the SNCOs that, that should be smart enough and willing to lose rank to, know to, that this to make sure work. that this is the wrong way. Yeah. Like, like, 13 Marines is a, you know, or 12 Marines and a sailor is what it was, right? One Corps man, 12 yeah. Marines. That's enough people, right? And there were enough NCOs that were in that group that died that one of them should have said, hey, this can't be right. We've got to, we got to be doing something different. And the fact that they did it, the fact that they were lazy, the fact that they were complacent, to me, to me is really sad. Like, I actually did a research. So we lost 13 people on that day. Fallujah, which is the hardest fought battle of, of, of the entire Iraq right. war. Like where people were dug in and all kinds of. From my understanding, we lost more Marines. I mean, I, I'd have to verify again, but if I remember correctly, we lost more Marines in Fallujah than any other war, or any other battle. I mean, in the in that yeah. war or campaign of wars, yeah. I should say, because technically right. Afghanistan and Iraq are different wars. But wait, but what what's crazy to me, what's really really freaking crazy to me, is that even though we lost. 13 Marines in that, which sounds crazy. We only lost 40 Marines in three days of fighting in Fallujah. Yep. Literally, we lost 40. over 25%. Fighting a larger, a much larger contingent. We killed anywhere between, the numbers vary, right, depending on who you look at, anywhere between 780, I think it's 780, 700 and something enemy combatants in Fallujah, upwards to 2,000. In Afghanistan, we killed none. And we lost 13. To me, that's ridiculous. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous that we could lose that many Marines in one attack. And yet in an entire war, right, we never lost that many Marines in one day. Like, like that just says a lot to me of the NCO leadership. And that's why, again, I'm very big. I, I, I just, it's a failure of the NCO leadership, not the other. But back to topic real quick, and then we got to cut this. Um... I thought we were done. No, no, we're 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 getting ready to be done. So okay. connecting points. So if I were to ask you, what are some common connecting points that you would look for in other business owners? What would it be? Um, no, we've had this very long conversation about it. It would be uh, people open to learning and doing things different. Um, and it would be people. Common uh, experiences. I want to think common experiences. Yeah. Uh, learning, doing things different. Uh, common experiences of starting things, okay. of having an idea and trying to find someone to uh, who <laughs> values it. Looking for resources. Um, looking for resources. And, uh, yeah, yeah, that would be, <laughs> that. The, that's the biggest thing All for right. me. I want you to think like this. I think what you really want is you want people who are trying to be innovative. Correct. Who innovative. are looking for resources. Right. People who understand there's power in other people's perspective. Right. I think those are big ones. And I think a big connecting point that you'd be able to connect with with a lot of people on is respecting our military for what they've done. Yes. Like, I think that seems to be something that's very big to you. Yes. So my my follow-up question, and then we'll end it on this. What's the reason you've not gotten involved with any of those organizations? Just time. I'm just been. So well, I'm busy. just saying, like you've never been a part of any organization around innovation. You've never been a part of any organization around military appreciation. Yeah, and it's I, not like I, they're I, meeting I, all the time. It's right. not like they're meeting no, once a no. month. They're meeting like once a quarter. Right. You no, know, I had a I, few I've, weeks at a yeah, time. For, I mean, Net you know, supported one group that was uh, that was very much um, helping veterans. Uh, get off the streets. Okay. Um, and other and other things for veterans. Uh, and uh, yeah, I we we as a group supported them one year, and then I haven't really followed up to support them and follow up with them since. But I just I just have been so busy. No, no, no. I I understand the business, the, but do you understand how like if you 
put yourself more around that community. Yeah. How inherently you would attract yourself to business owners that care about that community mm-hmm. and would be able to pull from that community as yeah. you're the marketing company to, to work with. Right. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I get okay. it. Okay. I get it. I just wanted to make sure like you're aware of that. Yeah, I'm aware of that. I'm I'm also just not aware because this is why you're in charge of you know, business development. This is why we work well together. Not this is why I'm in charge of business development. This is why we work well together because I bring a different perspective. I just wanted to bring that up because that's the whole point of the connection points and branding. Because the whole point of branding is is I is I go back to that that Sloya T-shirt company, well clothing right. company that you know I mentioned mm-hmm. in the blog. Yes, I mentioned them because that's branding. I think I also mentioned that Brandy one. I don't know if you saw it. Is the the Star Wars workout? Yes. Company. I read the Star Wars workout. Literally a six figure. I mean, I I look at the guy. Six figures. <laughs> six figures. Just literally coming up with beads and exercises. But he that could be seven. He could make seven. Possibly. I don't know how big the market really is. If he had the technical know how to what? this point, if he knew how to get a technical know how to create an app for it, possibly, probably. Without an app, I don't know if it's possible, but. But it, it's finding these kind of connection points that you really connect with and finding where's a group of people that has this these connecting points as well. Right. Right? Like like and I think the biggest way to do it and like the next step is to like basically get a giant poster board and just write all of them out. And then you look at which ones are their current groups that you're aware of that match these things, right? Like if there was and there's not, but if there was like a, a Southern Eats one. Okay, I know you like Southern, well, I don't know. Do you like Southern food? I always assumed you did, but I don't know. I like some Southern food. A lot of it I don't care for because I didn't, can't handle the gravy. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like some of it like I know you ate, some I know you did it. But... No. Fried chicken, yeah. Okay, but like if there was a group that you knew of that was, you know, something that you could relate to, mm-hmm. right, then it's like, okay, this is the group I can join. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then now you can take and go, hey, this is something I that, that I identify as a part of like a connecting point for me or as a connecting point for, for me as a person. What group is going to allow me to like match that connecting point with them? Does that make sense? Yep. And then that's how you build your branding. Okay. It is, is you find now other groups that exist that have people sharing those, you know, those dynamics. Like I think treating everyone as a human first is something that a lot of people are starting more and more to connect to. The problem I have is there's no current group for that. So that's more of a message thing that I think you can talk about and promote, which a lot of people would connect to that we care about. Mm-hmm. And actually, during my podcast, it's one of the things that I end up talking about. You know, when people ask me, like, what's the purpose of it? That's one of the things I often talk, bring up, you know, is the fact that I'm really big about how do we build connections with others and treat everyone as a human first, everything else second, instead of looking for the disagreements and looking for the you're different than me. And said, how do we look for the commonalities? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's, I mean, I think something a lot of people are connecting to right now because a lot of people do feel like the world's not in that space. So then the question becomes is how can you find that? Yeah, I don't know. Well, think about it. Like, what could you do that would allow people to connect to people being human first? I'm too tired right now <laughs> to think that. You got me at a bad time. But like social media wise, right? If you really want to make an impact, that would be the thing to do is to really think about how do I get people to think about human first? What would that look like? Okay. And then now you have social media, you know, videos or content you can create right. to create that, that perception. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. It does. All right. Well, that's awesome. That's it for today. <sighs> Branding's a lot of work. It's a lot of emotional the emotional side like for you real quick uh very emotional very emotional do you feel like you've had this kind of converse emotional conversations with your coaches in the past um or do you feel like this is just a different type of emotional or do you think it's, it's just different it's a different inter- it's different kind of emotional okay because i feel like you get a lot more emotional to these, these conversations than i've seen you with like the coaches i've seen you work with right but we've been working on different emotions mm, that's fair All right, well, that's it for this week.